guys doing tonight? <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful night. God, we just want to pause in this moment and just still our hearts. We know that you are the God over all of eternity, and yet you are willing to meet us in a moment. So God, we step into this moment. We want to lean into every opportunity, every possibility of what you have in mind. Father, I, I wanna pray for those who are here that maybe they're not even sure why they're here. They came because a friend invited them or maybe it was just an unexpected, spontaneous decision and they're not even sure if you exist. They're not sure if Jesus is who he says he is. They're not sure about this whole God faith thing. I just pray that you would, you would just wrap them up in your love, God, that you would just make yourself known to them. And God, I don't care if they hear a single word I say. I pray that they would hear your voice speak to them and tell them that you love them and that they matter, that you are here for them. And God, for the for the rest of us in this room. God, help us to, to not watch life happen, but to step into it and make life happen. We thank you, Jesus, that you came into human history for us, that you died on the cross for us, that you rose from the dead for us, that you're here in this moment for us. And so we pray in your name, amen. Amen. Hey, can we just thank God for tonight? Come on. You can have a seat. So we've been diving in for the past several weeks into the content of Chasing Daylight, and we've been specifically focusing on how to seize the power of divine moments, how to identify those defining moments in our life and step into them in such a way that it gives us the momentum for the life we long for. We've been building this out of a story in the scriptures where Saul is king and Jonathan is his son. It's a moment where they face overwhelming odds. It's a moment of conflict. It's an ominous moment where Saul knows that there's not a chance in the world they can win the battle they're about to step into in their own strength. So he decides to pull back. He decides to just let life happen. He decides to, to avoid the reality of the future that is waiting for him. And he goes to sleep. But in the middle of the night, his son, Jonathan, either wakes up or just gets up. And he wakes up his arm bearer and he says to him, let's go pick a fight. And, and this is the moment that we've stepped into to see that two people can be in the same moment and come out of it with two different futures. You may have moments in your life that you thought were mundane, that you thought were meaningless, that you thought were empty and void of anything significant, but that same moment for someone else was filled with opportunity and possibility. And the great danger in life is to watch life happen rather than to make life happen. And so as we dive into the specific section that we're in right now, I'm gonna to fold together two large thoughts. Because in chapter five, we talk about risk, that you need to live before you die and vice versa. That you're gonna have a decision to make in your life. You're gonna either live a life of risk or live a life of regret. And we pick up here in 1 Samuel 14, verse eight, and it says, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord is giving them into our hands. Now, right before this, when Jonathan wakes up his arm bearer, he says to him, let's go pick a fight. Maybe God will help. Now, that's not the most inspiring speech I've ever heard. Because if you're going to go fight an army 10,000 to one odds against you, you should pretty much know, right, that God's going to help. And so if you're the armor bearer and you're hearing this as a motivational speech, let's go pick a fight, maybe God will help us. I think I'd say, you know what? Go back to sleep, wake me when you know. <laughs> now it's not bad enough that Jonathan isn't sure if God's actually gonna help them in this moment. His strategy is the worst strategy I've ever seen in my life. 
I don't have to study the, the thinking of Patton or Eisenhower or Churchill to know this just doesn't work. Jonathan says, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. That's the worst strategy I've ever heard. See, I think even as an armor bearer, even as an unexperienced warrior, I'd go, I think that's not a good idea. I think we should not let them see us. I think since we're going, since we're going out in the dark of night, let's stay in the dark of night. And let's sort of sneak up on them and let's try not to let them see us. Let's not even let them hear us. Let's not let them know we're there. Maybe we'll live a little longer. What do you mean let them see us? Clearly, Jonathan was not thinking strategically. There was a different framework he was working from. See, Jonathan understood that what he was about to do, he could not do in his own strength. He knew that this journey was not a journey he could ever travel alone. See, there are places you can go in your life that you can go without God. But there, there is a life waiting for you that you cannot dive into, you cannot step into without God in your life. He says, let's step across this line and let's let them see us. There has to come a point in your life where you decide to step out of invisibility and step into visibility. See, I think a lot of us, we love being invisible because in the invisible, you're safe, you're secure, you're comfortable. When you're invisible, no one knows anything about you, so they may like everything about you they know. When you're invisible, no one really knows what motivates you. No one knows what drives you. No one knows what fuels you. When you're invisible, people can have all kinds of impressions of who you are that have nothing to do with who you are. And some of you have found the comfort of invisibility all of your life. Call it anonymity, whatever you may want to call it. But you see, I know a lot of times, invisibility is a great place because people really like you when you're invisible. It's when you become visible that you become a problem. It's when you become visible that you get criticized. It's when you become visible that you receive critique. It's when you become visible that judgment comes. And, and some of you may be the most amazing people in the world. And, and people look at you and go, they're, they're just, he's awesome. He's such a great guy. He's so kind. He's so caring. He's so compassionate. She's amazing. She's such a hard worker. She has such integrity. And they, they know everything about you that you want them to know, but they don't realize you're actually still invisible because they don't know why you're awesome. So there's some of you, you've been invisible with your faith. And so all they see is you and they think, wow, you're amazing. You're awesome. You're incredible. But you've remained invisible about the very source of your life. And Jonathan says, we're going to step out and we're going to let them see us. We're going to go beyond the point of no return. We're going to step into this uncomfortable space where people are going to see us. And if God doesn't show up, we're done. I love this space. In fact, when we were in Ecuador this past week, we just returned on Friday. And, and I, I heard two of our guys, Carlos and Andres. Andres is from Ecuador and Carlos is from Puerto Rico. They were talking about some of the journeys we've had together. And, and, and Andres was telling him how when we were in Guayaquil, which is one of the cities in Ecuador, he said, there's this area called Las Peñas. It's the most violent and dangerous favela in all of Ecuador. He goes, and I find out that when Ir Irwin has a break, he goes walking Las Peñas. He just starts going up and down the street. It was so beautiful. I loved it. The streets were unique. The architecture was extraordinary. The people were wonderful. So you can't go there. It's the most dangerous area in the entire city. I said, I've already been there. You ought to come with me. And I took him with me. He said, I've been in Ecuador all of my life. I'm from Ecuador, and I've never been to Las Peñas until Irwin took me into Las Peñas. And then Carlos said, same thing happened to me. We were in Puerto Rico. There's an area in Puerto Rico called La Perla. And he said, I've been there all my life, and I've never gone to La Perla. In fact, the only Puerto Rican I know has gone there is Felix. Because Felix, he's hood anyway. And so, he, so we're walking, and, and, and there's a tunnel that goes into La Perla. And my wife's like, you're not allowed to go down there. She already knows. And I see Felix strolling in that direction. I go, bro, where are you going? He's like, going down to La Perla. I used to skate down here. I go, you know, they, they told us not to go. And he goes, I know. I said, let's go. So we went down to the the team followed us down there. And Carlos goes, yeah, I've never been there my whole life, but he takes us to the most dangerous part of the city. I love this reputation. But I want you to know something. And I don't want you to be confused. I have the genetic makeup of a coward. 
I mean, whatever the DNA is for fear, I have that. See, I, whatever's happened and whatever's transpired over 60 years of my life, it's not because it began like that. When I, when I, was, when I was a kid, I was afraid of everything. I, I always thought there was, there was, there was like a genetic makeup for heroes, for courage, for nobility. The, the, those, those people were made out of a different human material than I was. I'm a coward. And I, I could identify the things I was afraid of. Well, of course, it was a long list. Because I was afraid of the dark. And I was afraid of heights. And I was afraid of dogs. And I was afraid of roller coasters. And that's all before I was 10. But I realized I wasn't afraid of those things. I was afraid of everything. And those things were just an object of my fear. Because as I grew up, see, it's really, it's adorable when you're afraid when you're three or four. You know, it's understandable when you're still afraid when you're eight or nine. It's a little unnerving when you're still afraid at 11 or 12, but when you're turning 14, 15, that fear becomes a real problem. And then when you turn 18, 19, 20, 21, and you're still, you're still paralyzed by fear, it becomes really obvious because it wasn't such a big deal for me when I was afraid of the dark. But then I became afraid of girls. <laughs> it became more important. See, when I was afraid of dogs and it paralyzed me, it didn't bother me as much as when I was afraid just to be rejected and it paralyzed me. And there's some of you here, you're paralyzed by fear. And you're going to live a life of regret because you avoid a life of risk. And a huge part of the problem is, is the language of faith has betrayed us. Somewhere along the line, we thought that faith would give us security, that faith would give us certainty, that faith would protect us. It would make us safe. But safe is not synonymous with certainty. Faith is an equivalent to uncertainty. See, faith does not make life predictable. Faith makes life adventurous. Faith does not remove all the possibilities of danger. Faith does not remove danger. Faith makes you dangerous. So if you're going to step in the moments that God has for you, you have to decide, I'm not going to live a life of regret. I'm going to choose a life of risk. I'm going to let them see me. I'm going to cross the line of faith. I'm going to step out of the invisible into the visible. There's some of you here. You've been hiding. You've been hiding. You've been hiding. And you're wondering, why doesn't God show up in my life? If you want God to be visible in your life, you need to show up and be visible in your life too. I was afraid of everything. In fact, I remember, was, I think around fourth grade, we were living in Miami and we were taking swim lessons where I learned how to save no one's life. And in that pool where we took our swim lessons, there'd be free time afterwards. And there were two diving boards. There was the low dive, and the high dive. Now, I was genetically predisposed for the low dive. I knew that was, the, that was the platform of my life. I was a low dive guy. Anybody here comfortable with the low dive? And, and the great thing with the low dive is there was no line. Because nobody wanted to jump off the low dive. Just me and one or two other cowards. And, and, and so I, I got to jump off the low dive as much as I wanted to. But, but the high dive was different. There was a line waiting to go up the high dive. All these kids would just be pushing each other as they would go up the ladder, climbing up to the high dive. I didn't need that. I was above that. I was way too mature to need that kind of rush in my life. So I would just sit in the pool watching kids go off the high dive, laughing mocking me, but I didn't want it. See, if you ask me, I don't need that. I don't want that. It's not for me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good with a low dive life. But eventually my friends realized I was just afraid. And so they would mock me and harass me and try to compel me and force me. You ever have people try to, try to shame you out of your fear? They don't understand how powerful fear is. You can bring all the shame on you want. If I'm afraid, I'm not going. And so I... <laughs> They tried to shame me, but I just stayed where I was. And, and you ever notice that fear resists data? You would think that empirical data 
would help you overcome fear, but it doesn't. Because I watched those kids jump one after another after another, kids older than me, kids my age, kids younger than me, kids that had barely been born, I mean children. <laughs> We're jumping off that high dive, and I don't want to be chauvinistic, but I was watching little girls jump off the high dive, laughing, having a great time. I had enough empirical data to prove to me that I could jump off that dive and live. That it would be okay, that I could do it. Everybody else could do it. They were just going one after another after another, and they would do it multiple times. So I, I had enough data, empirical data, to say to myself, this fear is irrational. But it didn't help. Because fear does not go away with reason. Because fear is not grounded in reason. So one day, I don't know what got into me. Just more shame than I could handle. More opportunity, more data. So finally one day I decided I'm, I'm, gonna, go, I'm gonna go off the high dive, I'm gonna do it. I remember getting, getting in line, it was a slow line. And you get in line, you ever, you ever been in one of those lines where you had more time to think about what you were about to do? And you didn't even want to do what you're going to do. But now you have more time to think about what you're about to do. And I, I'm in line, and I knew I could break out of that line up into when you start climbing that ladder. And even as I was in that line, I was thinking, you know, I don't need, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. I don't need this. I know who I am. And, uh, but but I, I, I just stayed in, and then I, I, I remember starting to climb that ladder. And as I was climbing the ladder, I, I, I started having second thoughts. Because the higher I went up the ladder the more I regretted my decision. And, and I wanted to go back down, but I couldn't because the, the ladder was just jammed with kids. I, I mean, my face was in some kid's butt and someone's face was in my butt. I mean, it was just like moving up and they're just pushing you up the way and there's no way back down. I wanted back down so bad. But I just kept going up with the momentum of the crowd. And then when I got to the very top and it was going to happen, I, I, I got to that last step on that ladder and I, I grabbed the handles on, on that high dive and I pulled myself up and I stepped on that, on that platform. I was terrified. And I, I looked to the sides and there's concrete on both sides. I'm the first person that's gonna ah, just go off sideways. <laughs> Cause of death, stupidity, it's gonna be there. <laughs> In that moment, it ended my life story and I was only 10. <laughs> and, and, Okay, okay. Just, just walk out. And I just, I remember just like walking my way out. And I don't know how the other kids, they just walked right out there. Like there's all this room. But when I got there, it was a really, really skinny platform. And I remember just thinking, oh, okay, just hang in there because don't, don't fall off to the side. And, and I just worked my way up. And all the kids going, jump, jump, jump. Like, Get out of my head. And I just, and I'm working my way to the front. And I got to the very edge. And then I, and my brother had told me, don't look down. But then I looked down. <laughs> you have to look where you're going. And I looked down. And I was paralyzed in that moment. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. It was so hot. It looked high from down below, but it was so much higher from up here. If I had known this, I would have never done this. And so in that moment, I realized, no. I, I can't do this. And so I, I started backing up slowly back off that platform, off that diving board. And I thought, this is embarrassing, but I'm going down. I already decided. I don't care. I, I know there are all these kids waiting on the ladder, but I'm going to just make them all move. I'm just going to go, excuse me, excuse me. Ex I'm going to be polite, but I'm going to just force my way back down. But what I didn't know, what I didn't factor is the meanest, cruelest, most unforgiving, unempathetic human being on the planet was right behind me, my brother. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you're not coming back this way. I said, move out of my way, I'm going down. He just said, you're not coming back this way. And my brother looked at me and he said, there's only one way down, and it's that way. I was so angry. I was so angry. How can he not understand? I can't go that way. It's like, jump. I turned around, so bitter and angry. He didn't understand me. He didn't know my pain. He didn't understand my fear. 
And I walked to the edge of that platform. I could hear them all, jump, jump, jump. And so finally, I just, out of sheer shame, I just took that last step, that last step of my life. <laughs> and I jumped. And I lived. I was alive. I felt so alive. I got this. I'm no longer a low dive. I'm a high dive. But I think a lot of us, we keep wondering why God doesn't show up in our life. And it's because when we're retreating, he's standing in the way saying, we can't go back this way. And then we become angry with God. God, why are you showing up in my life? Why aren't you helping me? God, why are you letting this be so hard? You ever just been mad at God because he made your life too hard? You ever been mad at him because he didn't make your success easier? You ever been mad at God because he put you on the high dive and then when you were too afraid, you wanted to go back and God said, you're not going back this way? Some of you are actually bitter and angry with God because he refuses to let you be a low dive and he's calling you to be a high dive. And then Jonathan tells them what strategy will follow their brilliant strategy of going past the point of return saying, let them see us. He says in verse 9, if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. In other words, when the Philistines see us, if they see us and say, wait there. We're gonna to come to you, and we're gonna just stand here and we're gonna die. Because that will be a sign that things aren't gonna go well. And then he says, but if they say, come up to us, we will climb up. Because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. See, they're walking through two cliffs. The Philistines are on the top of the cliff. If you know anything about military strategy, you know the high ground is the significant advantage. And if the Philistines had been foolish enough to say, wait there, we're gonna come and engage you in battle. I mean, that's what guys do. They always tell you ahead of time what they're gonna do. If the Philistines had started climbing down that cliff, Jonathan could have picked them off one at a time. Because when they're climbing down the cliff, they couldn't use their swords. That would have seemed to be the better approach. But he says, if we're told to wait, we're just gonna stay here and die like men. I think it's interesting that so many people of faith love the word wait. How in the world have we centered around the word wait rather than the word faith? Wow. Oh, wait in the Lord, wait in the Lord, wait in the Lord, because you're so fast. You're always having to let God catch up with you. <laughs> See, the reality is that for Jonathan, he knew God was moving faster than him. He knew that the way God worked in history was he moves with those who move. He says, but if they say, come up to us, that will be our sign. And we'll climb up. We'll climb up the cliff because we know that God's given us the victory. This is insane. And in fact, it goes on. It says, then Jonathan and his arm bearer. Now, stop for a minute because if you think of the Bible as a sacred text, Every word matters. And, and they use an entire sentence to tell us this. Jonathan and his arm bearer climbed up using their hands and feet. Oh. <laughs> I thought they would use their upper lip. I, I thought he was climbing up, just all upper lip, saving his arms and feet for a later <laughs> moment. <laughs> Why does he even bother to tell us that? It's because he wants us to know that when they're climbing up that cliff, they are completely vulnerable. They are defenseless, except God be their defense. And as they climb up that mountain, and right before they climbed, the Philistines did see them. And they said, look, they're the Hebrew dogs. Wander around in the night, come up here, and we'll teach you a lesson. See, that's the moment you kind of run for your life. And Jonathan goes, can you feel it? 
<laughs> this, is, this is like incredible. I got, this is one of those goosebump moments. God is showing up. And the armor bearer is going, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's God. I think those are really angry, large Philistines telling us come up and die. Goes, no, you can't see it. Because see, Jonathan had what I would call an advanced mentality. And, and this is really what I want to talk to you about just for a few moments. See, once you step into risk and you decide to live a life of risk rather than regret, you have to advance. You have to change your mind about the way God works in life. You need to go unless you get a no. See, I think a lot of us, we're just paralyzed waiting for God to tell us what to do. And so we don't do anything. It's odd. We keep waiting for a yes rather than a no. But, but see, God's already given you a big yes. So he said, go. In fact, that's what Jesus told his early followers. He said, go. He wasn't really very specific. In fact, he said, go. Take over the entire planet. Start wherever you want. Just go. Start where you are and keep going all the way out and transform the course of human history. I think a lot of us keep waiting for a go. And so we act as if our entire life is a no. But I want you to realize that God has already given you the go. So just say yes. Just move. Say, if they say, come up, this will be our sign from God. I want you to know that God is already calling you out. He's already calling you forward. He's already given you permission to live the life you created to live. You don't have to wait for a yes. You don't have to wait for a go. Just get going. But then you go, yeah, but going, doing what? Anybody paralyzed? I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do, but I just don't know what he wants me to do. Anybody been there? What is God's will for my life? So I'm going to give you two verses that will answer that question for the rest of your life. Do you want them? Yes. It's in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. I'm going to read this twice. The first time the way we've been taught to hear it, and the second time the way I need you to hear it. Verse 8 answers the question, what should you think about? Where should you let your mind go? Where should you let your imagination run? Finally, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so what we end up doing is we end up using this as a filter. Okay, whatever, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, this is the list. Now, now if I can just, just pare down with all of those, I'll finally know what God's will for my life is. See, I think a lot of us act like God's will is this tightrope. God wants me to do this, and then he wants me to do this, and I don't know what to do now, so I'm going to spend the rest of my life awkwardly balanced on this tightrope. Don't want to fall! But here's the crazy thing. You see, your life outside of God is actually a tightrope. Because when you live your life outside of God, your choices get smaller and smaller and smaller. So I want to read it to you the way I think it must be read. Finally, brothers and sisters, what should I think about? Whatever. Whatever is true. Whatever is noble. Whatever is right. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is admirable. He said, what should you think about? Whatever you want. Pick anything that's beautiful and true and good and think about it. You see, when you step into a relationship with the creator of the universe, your imagination has permission to expand. I was so angry by the violence this week. My, my heart just broke for this senseless act of violence in Pittsburgh the synagogue. It just reminded me that, that violence is the action of small-minded people with hardened hearts. See, violence, hatred, racism, jealousy, envy, greed, that's all been done. There's nothing creative about that. You want to be like everyone else? Choose that path. That's the smallest path a human being can take. And it makes you the smallest human you can be. 
He says, no, there's so much room. Do you know how many things are true? So many things are true. Just pick a truth. You know how many things are noble? You could choose your own nobility. You know how many things are pure? How many things are lovely? Oh, so many things are lovely. Just pick a lovely thing. Pick a beautiful thing and create it. What should I do with my life? Create something beautiful. But what? Whatever beautiful thing you can create. Whatever is admirable. How many things are there to admire? I admire so many things and so many people. He says, just whatever you admire, think about those. My imagination could run wild for all of eternity thinking about admirable and lovely and pure and right and noble and true things. Some of you are like, yeah, but that's what we should think about, but what should we do? Oh, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Because the very next verse gives you the answer. What should we do? Whatever. (laughs) Yeah, but specifically, what does God want me to do? Oh, let's just pop back up, since you didn't get it the first time. If anything, I love how specific anything is. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. God said, just go crazy, go wild, dream, imagine, and create. But what should I do? Whatever. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. He doesn't even give him a specific. Look, here's how free you are. Pick a whatever. Now, if you're choosing between good and evil, choose good. If you're choosing between right and wrong, choose right. If you're choosing between hatred and love, choose love. If you're choosing between bitterness and forgiveness, choose forgiveness. If you're choosing between despair and hope, choose hope. See how this works? See, every time you are faced with a decision, choose that which is beautiful and good and true. But in that, you have an endless universe of possibilities. And then Paul says, look, whatever you've learned, whatever you've received, whatever you've heard, whatever you've seen in me, Pick that. See, some of you are are paralyzed because you're so afraid of doing the wrong good thing. (laughs) Just pick a good thing and do it. Yeah, but I I wanna make sure I'm doing what God wants me to do. I know what he doesn't want you to do, nothing. So if you're doing nothing, you're definitely not doing what God wants you to do. And even in the physics of this whole thing, let's just say you're just so eager, so proactive, and you go out and you do someone else's good. What were you thinking? It's not like God's gonna go, what were you thinking? That wasn't your good. That was her good. Now she doesn't have that good to do because of you. I think God's more creative than that. I think the moment you do some good, God goes good on you. And the moment you do good, there's more good to be done. And by the way, you're designed for it. You're created for it. See, Jesus set you free, but you may not even know how to live in that freedom. You may be still acting Like you're a captive, you're living in the paralysis of fear and regret. You're living in this idea that you have to wait for God to say go, when God has already said go. I've given you freedom, I've given you new life. Now go and live it. It makes me mad when people without God live as if they have more freedom than people with God. It doesn't make me mad at the people without God. It makes me mad at the people with God because you're the freest person on this planet. And if you're a captive, it's on you. You built yourself. You locked yourself in. You threw away the key. So stop living in fear. Stop being paralyzed by what you don't know. And just pick a good and do it. And the the amazing thing about the way this works is as you lean forward into life, we work from an advanced mentality. God, I don't know if I should be doing this, but I just know this good needs to be done, so I'm gonna step into it. God has an amazing way while you're doing good to move you to the good you should be doing. 
And when you're doing a good, let's say you're doing a good that you're not supposed to be doing, you know what God's going to do? While you're doing the good that someone else is supposed to be doing, you're going to be doing a good that will point them to the good they should be doing. And the moment they see you doing that good, even though you're not very good at it, (laughs) see, because I've done a lot of good I'm not good at. And when I'm doing good that I'm not good at, it's amazing how that compels someone's actually good at it to come and do that good. So let's just all create a revolution of the good. Let's just go create something beautiful. Let's just do something that makes the world a little better and stop worrying about, is this my calling on my life? And just actually, this is what humanity needs. And so I'm going to do it. And who cares how many times you fail? Who cares how many times it doesn't work out? Who cares how many times someone else looked at you and says, yeah, I knew that you were not going to succeed. It's easy for someone watching life to judge yours. People who are living life just don't have time to judge someone else's. So if you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's whatever. I hope that sets you free. I can think about whatever as long as it makes the world better. I can do whatever as long as I'm creating good in the world. I am so free to do whatever I want that reflects the good of who God is. So go unless you get a no. And by the way, when you go unless you get a no, all the no's you get from people will have no impact on your life. Because when you're going with God's yes, everybody else's no is irrelevant. It was probably 25 years ago when I first moved to LA, this guy came out to visit and, and he, he said, hey, I have a day off, do you wanna go skiing? And I'd never been snow skiing in my life. And I said, sure, I'm, I'm happy to go, but I've, I've never skied. And he goes, that's okay. They have like these beginner classes and, and then after that we can, I'll teach you even some more and we can go skiing together. And, and he was really good. And so I said, sure, let's go. So we drove up to Big Bear and, and I was excited. I was excited to go skiing. I thought it'd be really a beautiful experience. And, and I went and rented my skis and all my equipment. And then I got into my, um, my beginner's class with all the 11 year olds. And, uh, <laughs> and there I was either with very short people or children, I'm not sure which one. And, and so there we were learning how to ski. And I realized they don't teach you how to ski in that first lesson. They teach you how to stand up and they teach you how to fall without getting injured. That's really the only thing they teach you. They don't teach you that whatever that is, that slushing thing. That thing where you look like James Bond. You know, see, see how much I know about skiing? And, and they don't teach you how to stop because they don't think you're actually going to go. There's really no need to teach you how to stop. You're going so slow. You just sort of, you don't stop, you slow. So after my 15, 20-minute class, my friend came over and said, hey, you ready to go? And I said, sure. And, and I said, now, now they told me like, there's these different like, signs and I, I need to stay at what's called like a green circle. And then I I should avoid like the blue squares and the black diamond thing. He goes, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Come on, let's go. And so we we got on a lift and I I thought the way the lifts worked is that they dropped you off at the green circle and then they drop you off at the blue square. Then they drop others off at the black diamond. But I learned very quickly that's not how they work. (laughs) That every one of those sections has their own lift. But my friend, he didn't want to be held back by me. So he put me on the lift with him going to the Black Diamond. And I had never skied in my entire life. And my first effort was a Black Diamond. And I remember when I saw the green circle, I said, hey, where do, where, where do I get off? And he goes, you, you don't. I go, no, no, I need, I, need to, I need to get off here. And he goes, hey, sorry, it's not gonna happen. And then we went to the blue square and I'm like, so can I, can I get off here? And he goes, dude, This thing has one stop at the top. This is the black diamond. I was pretty angry. Why didn't you tell me? He goes, it'll be okay. So we get to the top. Yeah, it'll be okay for him. And we got to the top and he said, hey, I'll see you at the bottom. (laughs) And he went, and I'm at the top thinking to myself, what do I do? I'm in fourth grade again. I'm on the, the high board. I'm going to die. And I'm at the top and, 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 and no one gave me any instructions. No one told me what to do. So I, 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 I developed a strategy. I pointed my skis in the direction of the largest snow drift 
I could see. And I just bent my knees, leaned forward, and choof, right to that giant pile of snow. <laughs> Crashed into it. Fortunately, there was no wood in the middle. I was good. Got myself up. I made some progress. S looked for the next giant snow pile. <laughs> Pointed my skis, bent my knees, leaned forward. <laughs> Did that three times, working my way down the mountain. Choose a place to explode <laughs> and go. About the third one, I was somewhere between the black diamond and I could see the, the blue squares down below. And I thought, I don't know if I can take one more hit. I'm pretty winded. And <laughs> so I, uh, I worked my way to the middle so that I could be in the middle so I wouldn't hit a tree. Because if there's a tree in front of me, one of us has to move and it won't be me. And, and, uh, <laughs> and so I set myself in the middle while all these people were skiing. Get out of the way! You can tell that guy's from LA. And, uh, <laughs> and then I just I remembered, lean forward, lean forward. So I bent my knees and I started leaning forward. And then <laughs> it's like my face was like plastic. It was just going back. <laughs> I didn't know how to slow down. I didn't know how to do the side the way thing. I was just holding on to my sticks. What are those sticks for? And I'm just going <laughs> and went all the way down that mountain. I'm leaving all those people in the dust as they're just choo, 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 bam, choo. I'm going all the way down that mountain. I'm holding on, don't fall, lean forward. And I came down and there was this, this patio made with logs and it had some ice on it. Do, 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 do. I'm hitting on the logs and I go all the way, ski right into the deck of the restaurant <laughs> with people everywhere eating food, watching me. And this ski instructor came over. He said, dude, you have cojones. I, I have never seen anyone in all my years of working here take that mountain wide open. You are fearless. I was like, yeah. That's how I roll. And I said, you know, the truth is, I didn't know how to stop. <laughs> so I just went forward until I ran out of momentum. I wonder how many of us underestimate how far we can go if you would just lean forward and live your life on the balls of your feet rather than on your heels. If you just had an advanced mentality, say, so I'm going to go unless I get a no. And that's not a no from all the naysayers and all the haters in your life. That's a no from God saying, no, that, that's, not, that's not your direction right now. Let me tell you, God has given you so much freedom. He's set you up so you can live your life wide open. And it's a strange thing because the rest of that day, I didn't do greens. They just seemed way, way too tame. I did a lot of blues for the rest of the afternoon, and right before we left, he said, hey, you ready to go? I said, nah, I'm not ready quite yet. I went down that black diamond, but not by choice. So I gotta go back up so I can do it by choice. It took me about an hour. <laughs> I was so exhausted. I fell so many times. It was the ugliest run recorded in history, but I didn't care. Because every time I fell, I got up. Every time I failed, I just pulled myself back up and said, nah, this is just a stop to where I'm going. <laughs> we were in Ecuador, and Emerson and Christina from Mexico City, they have a four-year-old son named Lincoln. I think he's four, so. They said Lincoln's kind of picked up a, a new phrase. They say, Lincoln, it's time for school. He says, maybe tomorrow. And so every day they said, we say, Lincoln, it's time to get dressed, maybe tomorrow. I said, oh, he's a true Mexican. <laughs> like, all us Latinos, it's like, quizás mañana, si Dios quiere, vamos a ver. Like, maybe tomorrow. 
See, there's some of you here, God has been calling you out. And you've been saying, maybe tomorrow. God has been offering you the life that you were created to live, and you've been saying, maybe tomorrow. You, you, you don't even like the life you have. You don't even like the you that you are. And yet you just keep holding on to the life in you that you wanted so desperately to leave behind. And God keeps saying, I, I can change you. I can make you different. I can make you better. I can give you the life you're created to live. I can give you a future that you will remember with such joy, without regret. How many times have you said to God, maybe tomorrow? See, a part of chasing daylight is seizing the power of every moment. And for some of you, it's time to leave behind the maybe tomorrow and say, God, today, now, this moment, this is my moment. The moment that will define my life. The moment that will define my future. The moment that will define me. It's time to step out of the invisible into the visible, to give your life to Jesus, and to live for him in such a way that you risk letting other people see what Jesus is doing in you. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? Just close your eyes. Just take a moment. Take a moment. But take this moment. If you're here and you're ready to cross the line of faith, if you're here and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, if you're here and you're done trying to do life alone and you're ready to let Jesus be the Lord and Master and God of your life, if you're ready for him to give you the forgiveness you need and the freedom you long for, I want you to pray a simple prayer with me right now. Just one sentence in this moment. Jesus, I give you my life. That's it, right now, just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Not tomorrow, not maybe tomorrow, right now. Just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Because if you'll give him your life, you'll receive the life he died to give you. This moment, Step out of the invisible into the visible. This moment, seize your divine moment. This moment, open your life to Jesus. Jesus, I give you my life. If you just prayed that prayer, if you just crossed the line of faith, if you just stepped into that space where you now belong to Jesus, you received his forgiveness and your freedom, I want to pray for you. But I want you to make a decision right now to step out of the invisible and become visible. You just confessed, you just pray, Jesus, I give you my life, but I want you right now just to make a decision to be visible. And I'm gonna pray for you, but right now what I want you to do is I want you to raise your hand if you just prayed that prayer. Right now, step out of the invisible and become visible right now. Right now, just take this, this step of faith right now. Just come out of the invisible and become visible. Right now, just raise your hand and say, yes, I just gave my life to Jesus. Yes, I just prayed, Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful, beautiful. Wonderful, so many people all over the room. Anyone else right now? Beautiful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Father, I thank you for all the women and men who in this moment have opened up their lives to you. God, I thank you that they just move from the invisible to the visible. They cross the line of faith. And I just pray that right now, God, you would just wrap them up in your love and let them know they belong to you. That you will never leave them or abandon them. That you've placed your life in them. There's a new future for them, a new life for them, a new hope for them. And God, I just pray that right now they would just begin to get a sense that this is the defining moment that will change everything for them. Not just in eternity, but in time. We thank you, Jesus, that you've met us in this moment. We pray in your name, amen. Can we just thank God for all those who respond to him right now? So good, so good, so beautiful. Now in a moment, one of our pastors is gonna come just give you some real quick directions for the next steps in your life. But I, I just wanna just challenge us as a community.
If we begin to live with this kind of mentality, if we have this advanced mentality, if we go unless we get a no, if we begin to choose risk rather than regret, if we decide to live before we die, and vice versa, I'm telling you, everything will change. So this week, I want you to make some decisions. I want you to come out of the invisible into the visible. I want you to take a risk with some people in your life. Now, it can be as simple as just inviting them to church next week. That will be a coming out party for you. You go to church. You go, yeah, I do. I've been hiding it because I've been invisible, but I'm trying to be visible. See, and maybe you can just give them a copy of Chasing Daylight and say, read chapter one. If you're interested, we can have a further conversation. Or maybe you can take them to lunch or dinner. Just do something that gets you out of this invisible space by serving someone else, by loving someone else, by caring about someone else. Because the moment we decide to let them see us, everything is gonna change. Because when you decide to live a life of faith, when you decide to step beyond the point of no return, when you decide to live a life that will only work if God shows up, I'm telling you, not only will you become visible, but God will become visible in your life. Let's all stand together and have a closing song.